And welcome everyone again to Plants, Pests, and Pathogens for 2021. We have a really great lineup today to launch our season. Um, I've just got a couple of really quick announcements before we jump into the challenges um, for Cupressaceae in North Carolina landscapes, and that will be Mike and Matt covering that. We're going to debut a new feature that I'll have this year, uh, this season, called Plant These Instead, which will talk about um, the plants that we don't want to plant and what you can plant instead, these more resilient pest-resistant plants for our landscapes. Finishing up with bolos, and please hang around till our closing announcements because we have quite a few announcements of exciting upcoming opportunities to finish this off today. So just want to let you guys know about this year's seasons of plants, pests, and pathogens. We will continue our every month, February through October schedule with uh, February, April, June, August, and October, having Mike, Matt and Mike as our feature speakers. They will be spending the time talking about current pest and plant disease issues. Um, and then we'll, of course, also have our Plant These Instead feature. Then in March, May, July, and September, we've got some great speakers lined up. For next month, for March, Inga Meadows is going to join us. She's with NC State University, and she's going to talk about some of her research on phytophthora-resistant annuals and perennials. So that is a serious root rot disease that if you have that in your landscape, there are a lot of things you can't grow. She's going to talk about what you can grow. Um, in May, <clears throat> excuse me, we have Shannon Curry who's with Hoffman Nursery joining us, and she's going to tell us about grasses and sedges. Then in July, Michelle Schroeder, who's with NC State, is going to talk to us about soil mycorrhizae, all the benefits they bring and how to encourage them uh, and keep them healthy in your soil. And uh, we'll finish off the guest speakers in September with uh, Dr. Jim Baker, who's a professor emeritus with NC State, and he's going to give us some reflections on his career and all he wished he had known. Um, so, of course, you can see the full schedule um, at go.ncsu.edu slash ppp or you can go to our youtube list to watch past recordings all right i am going to turn it over now to matt and mike who are going to talk to us about the challenges of cupressaceae which of course is the cypress family many of our conifers i'm going to stop sharing so they can start and welcome both Matt and Mike, and it's so exciting to be back again for our 2021 season of Plants, Pests, and Pathogens. Thank you, Charlotte. And Mike is there, oh, I guess. I am trying, hold on here. <laughs> there we go, okay. Um, yes, let me just, uh, First of all, can everybody hear me? Yep. All right. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Mike Munster. Uh, my avatar there is a micrograph of the epidermal cells of an ornamental sweet potato. It looks like stained glass in its color beauty there. And I am the diagnostician responsible for commercial ornamentals here at the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic on the NC State main campus. I. Um, I'm excited about this year too. We got some, some good things coming up. I'm looking forward to our guest speakers. And uh, I don't wanna start without mentioning, I hope that everyone there in your, in your families, in your lives is safe and doing well. And, and my condolences to any of those who have suffered in the pandemic so far. Um, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And so we're all also hopeful for, for the next few months looking up. Now, if I can share my screen here. All right. Does everyone see the challenges for Cupressaceae in North Carolina landscapes? Yes, we do. Yes, right. This is um, a little bit different approach than we've taken in the past, where we're going to look instead of disease by disease or pest by pest, look at a group of host plants and the problems that tend to affect them. And we're going to do it with the uh, Cupressaceae, which is one of the families that we, we see a lot here in the clinic. And we're going to focus especially because of time limitations on um, Arborvitae and Leyland Cypress. Oops. So Arborvitae, of course, is um, very popular as a screen. And you can see what happens when you lose one member of that screen and you, and you 
don't get the effect that you wanted. And then of course there's difficulties in trying to fill that gap. We have uh, species and hybrids, of course, in the genus Thuya. And it turns out that if you look at last year's data from the clinic of the woody ornamentals that we received, the fourth most popular plant in terms of number of samples received was arborvitae here in the clinic. So it does frequently get sent to us. And I'm going to really emphasize right from the beginning that if it happens that you need to send us a sample or one of your clients does, make sure that we get those roots in soil because there's almost nothing that we can diagnose on the foliage of arborvitae. Uh, the other big member of the gene, excuse me, the family that uh, we're going to talk about today are the Leyland cypress, which is an intergeneric hybrid. And it's also used quite a bit for screening. It has some disease problems in common with arborvitae and some that are, uh, if not unique, at least different from those you would find on the arborvitaes. We'll only have time to just briefly mention junipers, many species and hybrids that are used in the landscape of everything from our native eastern red cedar to some of the prostrate cultivars to the crazy looking, uh, it's, a, it's a Chinese juniper, the Hollywood juniper that you see there on the right. And the fourth pillar of the, the landscapes as far as this family is concerned is the Japanese cedar, Cryptomeria japonica, which you are probably seeing with a lot of bronzing this time of year because it's the winter. And you're probably seeing the tip die back any time of the year. And we still, after years of effort, uh, when it comes in the clinic, we have not been able to figure out the cause of this. There are quite a few other less common members of the Cupressaceae that are used in landscapes, everything from Italian cypress to our native bald cypress and a few others, the, the Camisipris. But Deodar cedar, even though it's called a cedar, is actually in the Pinaceae, so it's not a member of the Cupressaceae at all. Now let me start out with this quiz here. So I'll, I will launch a poll with choices A through D. And the question is, of these photos, which of them represents a disease? So give you a moment to think about that and put in your answer. Just so you know, we cannot see who's answering. We only can see the conglomerate. Uh, yeah, and I will ask folks to use the, the button there on the, on the poll rather than, than circling or writing your answer on the screen. Give folks another 12 seconds here, round up a minute. So we've got a little more than half who have chimed in now. So I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and share those results. So you can see that the most popular answer was photograph C, and that is actually correct. However, I do want to emphasize that when we, when we go about the diagnostic process, I mean, I, I kind of set you up a little bit there because I want to emphasize again, the importance of what we talked about a few years ago as a special feature the entire year on plant pests and pathogens, which is the diagnostic process of collecting all the information that you need to really come to a hypothesis and then a conclusion as to what the cause of, of a disease is. But for those who have participated over the years, you probably recognize the photograph and see as, a, as an example of a root rot disease, this in Leyland cypress. Uh, number or letter A, if you were at the site, you would probably easily diagnose it because it's at the near the entrance to a, a dog training site um, in, in Garner, North Carolina. So you can imagine the, what's going on there. And B and D, we will talk about later in the program. I want to make the URL for this available. So it's this is a this is a table that's put on our 
web page, but it's not linked from anything. So you actually have to have, for the moment anyway, you actually have to have the, um, the URL, which I'm gonna put in the chat. And you can link to that and then uh, print it off at your convenience to summarize some of the problems that we have with, with plants in this particular family. And I, I didn't include the, the arthropod pests, but Matt will talk about those toward the end of the spiel today. And I, to make it easier, broke this up into different sections. And you can kind of see some patterns here when you do this. The first section at the top are the root rot problems, which tend to be shared by the members of the family. So Phytophthora and Armillaria root rots, you're going to find probably equally likely in Arborvitae, more likely with root rot in Leyland Cypress, quite a bit more frequent to have Phytophthora than Armillaria. And the junipers can have either one, but uh, if you don't have the table printed out uh, to put a note on it, just kind of take a marker and put an asterisk on your screen there uh, for where it says junipers, because the Phytophthora and Armillaria root rots are not gonna be a problem on our Eastern red cedars. They will be problems on some of our other landscape junipers though. We will also occasionally on juniper see a nosum root rot, but it's not frequent enough to really talk about today and <clears throat> not something we see on the, the two types of trees that we're talking about principally. The second block are some of the stem and needle problems. And you notice that there it's really heavily skewed toward Leyland Cypress. So we do have some of the Bactrosphere and Diplodia cankers on the other trees, but, um, but worse on the Leylands. And Ceridium canker, we will basically only see on the, uh, on the Leylands. The Passilora, eh, you could see that perhaps on a, on a juniper here and there, but you're not gonna see it on the, on the Arborvitae. So notice there's that blank there, really the Arborvitaes don't have much in the way of uh, of needle problems. So again, the importance of making sure that we get roots with any sample. And then in the last block there, you'll see even fewer representation or none by the Arborvitaes and Leylands, but these are a couple of tip lights that junipers can get and then the rusts, which you're familiar with. And we'll only mention a little bit in the bolos at the very end. And finally, the internal browning, which is a uh, physiological situation and not a disease at all. And that one is, uh, is of course, quite common on, uh, on Arborvitae and also we'll see it on Leyland. Okay. So talking then about the, the root rots themselves, sometimes it's easy and a lot of this will be review, but uh, it's sometimes it's easy to tell when you've got root rot, things are just turned to mush there, but oftentimes because even healthy roots of trees and shrubs, once they're mature, will have a dark color. We can't tell at first glance and you wanna use the pull technique. And if the outer tissue will pull and slide like a bead on a wire uh, against the steel, the, the vascular tissue at the center, then that's your indication that you do have root rot. And you can't tell just by looking which one you have. So in this case, one of these is Armillaria root rot and the other is Phytophthora root rot, both on Leyland Cypress, both about seven years in their respective landscapes. But you really have to dig down if you're gonna be able to diagnose these. And there are a lot of important differences between the two. So Armillaria will cause root and butt rots and affects mostly woody hosts. So our trees and shrubs. It is a Basidiomycete, a true fungus, and there are only a few species that we have in North Carolina. And most importantly, this is often diagnosable in the field. And I'll mention how to do that. You can get a kind of an idea there, looking under the bark of that root, what we're gonna be using as our, our diagnostic tool. For Phytophthora, this can cause both root rots and foliar blights on both woody and herbaceous hosts. It is not a true fungus, but what we call a water mold, an oomycete. I used to like to tell students that a, a fungus, that, or this is, uh, a fungus is more closely related to a cow than it is to 
let's say Phytophthora or, or Pythium, the water molds. However, they're ecologically like fungi. So if you're talking to the public, I don't see any problem with calling them fungi. There are many species of Phytophthora and uh, so that can be uh, an important issue as well. And this one, we're gonna require laboratory diagnosis to, to confirm. And let me just take a moment to, um, I see that there's some markings going on there with the, the annotations on the screen. So I'll ask folks to, to please refrain from doing that so that uh, so there's not a distraction. Appreciate that. Specifically here, armillaria root rot, some of the symptoms that you'll see above ground, thinning of the foliage, wilting, browning, and we'll sometimes see cracking in the, in the bark and some resinosis or oozing. That is not a specific symptom though. It shows you that the tree is under stress, but it doesn't tell you exactly why. And this is, I think, the photo that Charlotte had at the very top. Here's an example of what can happen when only one stem of a multi-stem arborvitae has been killed by arbolaria. And the aspect that we can diagnose in the field is, is made possible by the fungus producing these cream colored mats of mycelium between the bark and the wood at the base of the stump or in the largest roots. So obviously this is something that you wanna do only when you know that that tree is no longer viable and is gonna be removed because it's a pretty destructive type of sample. So if you can chop in there and peel off the bark and see this kind of white to cream colored fungal mycelium, then that tells you you've got armillaria. Unfortunately, sometimes it's a little bit questionable even here in the clinic where uh, go back and forth on some samples, is it or isn't it? But when you've got a really good case, like in these two examples, then that's your diagnosis. It's also called mushroom root rot because in the fall of the year, it will sometimes, not always, produce clusters of these honey-colored mushrooms that uh, uh, near, the, near the infected tree or stump. Phytophthora, on the other hand, is not diagnosable, diagnosable that way. It does not produce any mushrooms or any visible mycelium, but it will uh, debilitate and kill plants. So here's an example of a little boxwood topiary that had Phytophthora root rot. Here was a creeping raspberry in the landscape here on campus with some kind of reddening and small leaves, Phytophthora root rot. And here's, a, I really like this picture that Sean Banks took several years ago now showing two lilac cypresses one side, um, on one side with Phytophthora root rot and practically dead. And it turns out that there was a drain near that holding anchor for a, for a dog's chain, there was a water outlet from a roof drain that, uh, that opened there. So excess moisture is really one of the factors that helps drive Phytophthora. And the reason for that is because it has these swimming spores. I'm gonna try and play this video. So sporangia are the small round to teardrop shaped structures that produce the spores and they're called zoospores because they swim around and you can see one moving there. And in this video here, we can see a number of them. So anything that moves water or moves soil will move Phytophthora with it. And we tend to see it as in this photograph here, another from Sean Banks, we tend to see it occurring at low spots in the line of trees, but then it can kind of move down the line as can armillaria. So what good does it do to know all this? I mean, I've got a tree, it died, why do I care? Well, first thing you really do need is that diagnosis because it's gonna affect what you may or may not be able to do next in, in that location. If disease is confirmed, you wanna of course remove the affected tree or the shrub, including the stump and the large roots. In the case of armillaria, this is especially important because that's where it's going to survive on that remaining woody material. If it's a hedge planting, then we would recommend removing the tree on either side of that diseased tree. 
and people don't want to hear that, but there's a good chance that it's already moved down the line and just hasn't shown symptoms yet. And people also don't want to hear that they shouldn't plant another tree or shrub in that spot for a couple of years to give the fungus time to die out as what's left of the woody substrate in the soil breaks down. In the case of Phytophthora, it's really never going to go away. So you want to take away its advantage, which is excess moisture, by raising the beds and adding organic matter and using plants that are less susceptible. And we do have a publication about that. And uh, as you saw at the top of the program, Inga Meadows is going to be speaking about the annuals and perennials that are, uh, are usable when you've got Phytophthora in the soil. And of course, avoiding overwatering is, is another good thing. There is no chemical control for these root rods. They're just too deep in the soil. There's too much volume involved to try and be able to, to keep those at bay with any kind of chemical control. Uh, this is the, oh, unfortunately, I didn't copy that to, uh, when, it, when it's not my turn, I'll, I'll get the link to this so that you'll have the, the publication handy. But that's the Managing Phytophthora publication, AG 747. You can also look it up that way. So a quick review here, see if you got the idea. Uh, let's launch the A through D poll again. So which of the following is true of armillaria root rot? It can be diagnosed in the field. It affects few kinds of trees or shrubs. It dies out quickly in the soil. Eastern red cedar is a common host. Give folks a few seconds to to think about that. And what are we doing on time here? 23. Okay, I think I think we're doing well on time. Wow, a lot of people jumping in here. I think we've had a quicker response to this poll than we did to the last one. It's also impressive that 225 people are are logged in this morning. All right, another 10 seconds or so. Seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one. And yes, correct. Our malaria can often be diagnosed in the field with that destructive sample. Uh, it does affect many kinds of trees and shrubs, unfortunately. So B is not correct. Um, I guess in the big geological time scales, it does die out quickly, but when we say a couple of years, that's usually not quick enough for, for most people's taste. And Eastern Red Cedar, for those of you who marked your screens back when I said to put the asterisk on there, that's probably still there. Uh, red Cedar is not a common host of either Armalaya root rot or, or Phytophthora. All right. Part two then, twig blights and cankers and Passalora needle blight. Start um, with this. It was hard for me to find a good photo to represent this, but with these canker diseases, Botrysferia and Diplodia, for example, they can affect major branches, but then leave other branches unaffected. So you see this, this sort of pattern in a tree. And that's because it's girdling the branch lower down, but not as far down as in the roots. Uh, identifying cankers, again, review, this is not in the Cooper Stacey, this is a lower petalum, but it just shows that sometimes you need to get your knife out and look under the bark to see if you've got diseased cambium or wood. In cross-section, this is uh, actually Phomopsis canker on azalea. Sometimes you'll see the pie piece shaped area of darkened wood when you have a canker. And you may see something like this, where you cut into something that looked like a canker, and it turns out there's healthy cambium and healthy wood underneath. It was just because there had been an injury to this branch that then begun, began to heal over. Now, here's a good example of a, a canker. This is about just free canker on a Leyland cypress from a nursery. And you can see not just the diseased area of bark there, but also the small dark fruiting bodies of the fungus where it's producing its spores. This is not gonna make a mushroom that's gonna be obvious, but a more uh, subtle sort of sign of the fungus, the, the small fruiting bodies there. And sometimes we have to put these in incubation to get those to come out. 
Here again is an example where there were individual stems on the skyrocket juniper that were dying out. And it turns out that there was diplodia canker. So that's another related fungus to Botrysphaeria. And the girdling allows or causes the stem to die from that point upward while others remain green. You will see another slide having to do with this sample later on in the program, just to show that sometimes there's more than one thing going on. Ceridium canker is something very particular. It's only found on Leyland. Well, no, I should take that back. It is found on some others, but it's not found on, on Arborvitae or really on Juniper. Um, I think, that, yeah, the Italian Cypress definitely does get it. But uh, of the ones that we're talking about today, Leyland is, is the concern. And this doesn't affect usually the major branches, just the tips. So it will girdle a portion of a twig. And then from that point outward, it dies often turning a sort of an orangish color. And these can just be pruned out if the tree is not too large to do that. But notice the difference between that where you've got the tip dead and then farther below green versus a pattern where older needles are dying, but the new growth is green. So that is a very different disease. That's Passilora needle blight, actually on Monterey Cypress in that photograph, but it does affect Leyland Cypress and sometimes quite seriously. It's caused by a fungus called Passilora sequoiae, and that's a fungus that has more aliases than a outlaw from the Old West. It's been called uh, Cercospora sequoia, it's been called Cercosporidium, it's been called Asperospermum, and uh, Passilor is the current name. I love this sequoia because it's got every vowel in the alphabet there in that one word. So typical pattern, bottom, uh, moving from the bottom up and from the inside out where the, the moisture is highest is where it's getting its start. And you might almost confuse this for a, a root disease, but you notice how the tops of the trees are still looking pretty good. If you have a hand lens, you can look up close at the right time of year and you'll see the sign of the fungus, the spores being produced in this olive green tufts on the needle. So that's one needle filling up practically the whole screen there. And that is useful for deciding because in this case, there can be a chemical control or management applied. And you wanna do that when the sporulation is observed. And if you wanna see the details of that, just look on page 512 of this year's North Carolina Agricultural Chemicals Manual. And it gives some information about when you would scout for that and how you would do the applications. But you'll notice that in most cases, these diseases we're talking about, there really is no chemical control. I didn't want to talk about this, but um, Matt kind of shamed me into it by talking about uh, a particular insect that you'll, you'll see later. So we have, I've seen this disease once in my career in the clinic, and it's called cedar leaf blight. It's caused by the fungus Didymoscella thugina. And you'll notice that again, individual needles are being affected, but you might confuse this for some kind of stress that was happening lower down that was starting to cause the needles to senesce and die. Uh, that has a very particular looking sign though, of this uh, fruiting body with kind of a, a flap over it. And like I said, I've seen it once and there was another, it was an image sample that was probably it, but those were the two cases out of the last 12, 13 years where it's come in the clinic. So again, submitting foliage alone of arborvitae is gonna be an insufficient sample, unless it just happens to be this. Very quickly, because abiotic issues are sometimes even more important than the diseases or pests. Um, launch pole again. So, what do you think these trees have in common here? They all suffer from chemical injury, seasonal leaf drop, drought, or none of the above. And keep in mind that this picture was taken in December of this past year. So. And some people have commented about the pole 
covering up part of the slide and just a reminder to folks, you should be able to move the poll on your screen by putting your mouse over it and, and just holding down, uh, you know, left click and pick it up and move it. Or if you're on an iPad, if you just put your finger on it, you might need to do that towards the top of the poll, but you should be able to move it around on the screen. Thank you, Shelley. Yeah, I can see that that would be a problem if you can't answer the poll because you can't read the choices. All right, um, we've got a minute there of polling, so we will stop it. Apologize to those who are still pondering the question. Oh, we've got a tie. I've never seen that before. Between um, B, seasonal leaf drop, and D, nothing. Well, the actual answer is B. The tree, the arbor variety there on the left and the maple on the right are both dropping their old foliage. And the way I like to say it is that evergreens, just because a tree is evergreen doesn't mean that individual needles or leaves are immortal. So the tree, once those are a couple of years old, especially as they get to the interior portion of the tree, those will be, will be dropped, will be shed in favor of the obviously newer growth on the exterior portion. So this is a condition that in, in Arbor Vitae and Leyland we call internal browning. So it's not actually a disease, it's a normal process, but it does cause concern and when, when homeowners see it sometimes. And obviously if you're starting to see this happening on last year's and this year's needles, then you do have a problem, but it's a very common occurrence. And finally, um, I don't know how many people still know the, the rest of this saying, we have met the enemy. Can anybody finish that? I have a chat and he is us. And he is us, right. Uh, which came from a, a Pogo cartoon uh, before my time even, which was a, a play on a phrase that a general had said that we have met the enemy and he is ours. But sometimes we have met the enemy and he is us. And in this case, whoever planted these arborvitaes too deep, that was a, a mistake. I would recommend that uh, you check out the tree planting videos that Barb Fair has put together. They're excellent uh, to make sure that you don't make some of the common mistakes. And another case where we have met the enemy and he is us can be, in this case, suspected herbicide exposure that caused the curling of and deformation and stunting of these needles. So there are a couple of reasons that, uh, that we are sometimes responsible for the damage. With that, let me, unless there is a quick question, I haven't been viewing the chat. Ponding my yard, can this lead to root disease? The best to just fill a devil Oh, oh, okay. Ah, Chris, interesting question, yes. Ponding can lead to root diseases. It does not usually cause the direct death of roots unless they stay, the, the soil stays saturated for, for days. Uh, so direct drowning of, of trees is not common, but it can definitely favor root rot. Uh, as far as what to do about it, I would not necessarily fill that divot in. I would look up, um, Ann Krauss and, uh, I'm sorry, Helen Krauss and Ann Spafford's book, 2009, Rain Gardening in the Southeast, where they talk about actually making those kind of areas deliberately so that water will flow more slowly through the, through the landscape, trapping soil, sediment, and, and contaminants, and what kind of plants you can use in those kind of areas. So I would look at that actually as an opportunity. It may not be for any tree or plant that you have there already. But um, I would look into that before I would think about any kind of, uh, of, of filling in of that. Now, there may be some cases where you would want to do that. If it's an area we're trying to raise vegetables, I've got that situation. Um, but um, think about that first, how you might actually make it, take advantage of that. All right. Uh, OK, I see. Oh, thank you. Charlotte for putting the link there to the, the phytophthora 
publication. All right, I will stop. Oh no, I'm gonna keep sharing actually because it's only on my PowerPoint and I will stop talking and let Matt take it over and he will just tell me when he wants to advance the slides. Sure, well, thanks Mike uh, for putting this together. And you had a question mark on the uh, herbicide photo uh, as far as whether it was me, what, that was one of my photos. Uh, so you can take that question mark away next time. Um, but uh, yeah, so there are definitely some arthropod pests of Cupressaceae, um, particularly a few kind of more sedentary and very small arthropods. So that's unfortunate. Hopefully you all have some hand lenses out there, a good powered hand lens. You should be able to identify these things, but um, otherwise uh, we can move to the next slide, I guess, Mike. So um, there are a couple scales that are really common on uh, different members of this family of plants. Um, they are often found in low numbers. Like if you search, you're gonna find some. So we really, I often look at the densities and to discuss whether they could be contributing to issues. Um, these scales can not only result from stressed plants, but can obviously also cause further stress to the plants. So sometimes it goes hand in hand. So sometimes a stressed plant is weaker and will not be able to fight off these critters and they become more uh, numerous on the plants. So the first is mass scale scales. Um, we got a few samples of this fairly recently um, and they were on plants to, um, that also had some other issues. But um, this is Lepidosaphis pallida. It's uh, one of the more, it's an armored scale, so it does have a covering. So the, each of these little brown things, um, and I can't point at it, I'm trying to point at it, but <laughs> um, each of those little brown uh, oyster shells is a female, and underneath that uh, shell will be a soft, long, yellowish um, uh, scale insect. Uh, you can pick them off with a little needle or, or forceps or anything, um, and you can see that they'll scrape off. Now, again, I really, you know, if you find a few here and there, that's fairly typical for a lot of these plants. But if you start to see densities like this, where you see all those little brown spots all over where they're insects, uh, especially on the newer foliage, that that's, uh, I would say, time to start thinking about management and especially also to um, look at stress management for the plants where you can, you know, make sure that they're watered enough, make sure that there aren't diseases affecting them, things like that. So, uh, but I would definitely do some uh, scale control on something like this where there was high densities. Okay. I think you can go to the next one, Mike. All right, and uh, as I'm advancing here, let me also mention <laughs> this, this was the tree from which that, that skyrocket juniper that had the diplodia canker on it. Yeah, so you do often see these things going hand in hand. Again, when the plants are stressed, they're, they're less able to fight off these things. Another one is the minute cypress scale, and there's actually a very uh, Caryolaspis minima. There's also another Caryolaspis called the juniper scale. Very similar, you can only really identify the difference under the microscope, so um, I won't go into that. But um, here actually is a male and a female. Uh, the male developing scales, basically of armored scales look very similar. Um, they're that little uh, long one on the left. Uh, they look kind of like a little uh, ice cream, or I think it looks like little cake icing that's been spread a little bit. Um, they look even more so in other scales. But this is also an armored scale, but it has a papery white circular uh, covering rather than that long brown oyster shell covering. So that tells you the difference, but this, the management for the, both these scales, since they're both armored scales is very similar. Uh, certain kinds of dormant, dormant oils, uh, things like that, and also some other pesticides, insecticides can be used on these, uh, on these pests. But again, you, you can usually find at least a few of these uh, scattered around these plants naturally. And so unless they're really high densities, I typically don't consider them an issue um, so if you find one, I wouldn't go out and go crazy and spraying, but if you're starting to see a lot of them, then I would definitely consider it. Okay, Mike. All right, now another really common pest, and this is really highly magnified image, are spruce spider mites. So uh, Oligonychus anunguis. And so this is a true spider mite related to two spider spider mites, but in a different genus. Um, and uh, they are a cooler season mite. So you really don't see them, uh, right now they're usually overwintering as eggs, 
Uh, as it warms up uh, in the spring, they'll become more active. They'll hatch. Uh, the adults will hatch. They'll become, or the the larvae will hatch. They'll develop into adults. They'll cause more damage in the spring, in the summer, in the real the heat. Things basically they they go dormant. They don't really uh, feed or do much. Then in the fall, when it cools down a little bit, they'll start their activity, lay uh, reproduce, lay eggs, and overwinter. Um, now again, these are microscopic. You may see. Um, you may see with a hand lens the little shed skins, these little white, uh, these, those little white things also shed uh, uh, eggshells, this, the, uh, the spherical, clear spherical things. Uh, but if you see the active infestations, you can see these reddish uh, eggs with a little hair on them. Uh, that's uh, that's very typical of uh, spruce spider mites and these spider mites, you know, the, they look like little um, soft bags with legs with lots of hairs. Um, if during the active season, what you can do, if you suspect you have uh, an infestation, you can take a little twig, beat it against a piece of paper and look for any little red mites walking around. There are a couple other types of mites that live on these trees. So you may find some incidentals, but uh, another good um, indication, and I don't, we don't have a good picture of it here, but the, the um, needles, the green needles will get a yellow tinge, will get yellow stippling or a little, they look like little pinpricks all over, or oftentimes in high infestations, you see the green foliage turning kind of a greasy grayish color. They're really, um, it dulls the plant. Uh, it makes it look kind of like it's been a little water soaked or um, or, or you'll have that yellowing all over. So those are common um, symptoms of spruce spider mites, which suck individual cell contents, the, the green out of the cells of the plant. You can see how small they are in comparison to the needles. Uh, but this is a very common pest. We see, again, we see sometimes uh, high densities of this pest and then control is recommended. But you can, uh, like the scales, you can almost always find at least a few on just about every tree you have out there. So again, density is, is usually key. And Matt, could you address the, the issue of the common name versus what the hosts actually are? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, that's, I should mention, this is, this is a very wide host range of conifers. And so uh, even um, uh, members of Pinacea, Pinaceae, so like spruces, of course, from the, from the name. But of course, we're in we're talking about Cypress uh, Cupressaceae today, and so they are very common on basically just about all of the um, needled evergreen um, uh, pines and and uh, cypresses, things like that. So very broad host range within that kind of group of trees. Okay, we go to the next one then, I guess. Okay, so this was actually on the quiz at the beginning. Uh, so what is this? You can actually see this uh, area of the twig that's bronzing. You can see the needles are bronzing and then the rest of the foliage is very beautiful green. Uh, if you follow that bronzing twig down, you see something. Uh, it's this little swelling at the, at the base where that twig is. And um, if we look further, so there you go. So if we look further, this may look like a canker or something like that, but if you uh, actually investigate more, break it open and cut it open, uh, you can see what's on the next page. So this is actually a little silken loop. And this little silken loop is the remnants of an old bagworm bag. And what happens is this silk is so strong that if it, even if the bag is removed, if the, if the silk is left on the twig, what it does is it strangles the twig and basically, uh, uh, liquids and nutrients flow one way, but have the uh, everything flowing back gets stopped. And so you basically have this buildup of pressure and this growth of this knob that then kind of girdles that branch. And so you may see certain branches turning completely uh, from green to yellow to brown, um, whereas other branches are beautiful green, they look very healthy. So always follow these branches back to the source where they turn from yellow to green again. And if you find this knob or you find this tie off, this may be a culprit actually. Uh, and so we do suggest, and we can move to the next slide, I guess, Mike. Um, we do suggest this time of year, especially if you have plants with these bags on them to remove them from the trees using a, a, a razor uh, or something like that, basically cutting the silk tie off. Uh, that'll not only 
guard the uh, trees from the girdling that happens. Uh, but also once you remove that bag, that bag, if it, is, if it had a female in it, the female would have laid eggs last fall and those eggs are overwintering right now. And in about uh, a couple months, once it starts getting warm enough, you have the young emerge from these bags and start to infest the plants. And you can go to the next one, Mike. And so, you know, most people notice the bagworms when they're huge, when they're about an inch long and they're crawling around. At that point, it's really difficult to control them. What you need to do is to make sure if you have plants that are infested by these or plants nearby plants that were infested um, and that the bags have remained and hatched, is to um, investigate for these little tiny bagworms. And you can see there are many, many specimens on this one little branch of this um, of this plant right here. And so the bagworms do make are very small, but they still make those little tiny bags. Uh, you can again um, beat some of the twigs onto a onto a piece of paper or, or sheet or something like that and look for these small bagworms. This is the time you want to treat and that's going to be around May or June uh, when they start to emerge. Uh, by midsummer, uh, early fall, that's you know basically they're going to be done doing a lot of damage and can completely defoliate small trees uh, and repeated infestations can kill trees. So uh, bagworms can be an issue. Okay. Uh, and then there's this, it looks like it could be some kind of needle blight or some kind of other issue. You can see the random browning of different needles and, and different tips of these, of this um, arvitae and uh, but if you actually investigate further, they're not just dead or they don't have fungi, fungi associated with it, but you can actually see if you break them open, you'll see little holes in them often. Uh, and you can actually break those, those twigs and the needles open and find frass, so little dry pellets of fecal matter and even caterpillars sometimes. So that very tiny caterpillar right there, you know, I broke off that little twig and the caterpillar rear end is, is facing out. Um, these very tiny caterpillars are, are uh, known as the arborvitae leaf miner, uh, Argaresthia thuyella. Um, they are very tiny moths. You can see that one moth sitting among the needles. They're only a few millimeters long. Um, they do mine the leaves of uh, Thuya occidentalis and other Thuya species, so other arborvitae, uh, plus false cypress, Camisiparis. Um, Again, they may look like uh, disease or, tip, or browning tips, but if you find those holes and frass, break those open, look for the caterpillars, you can identify that that's what these are. These do have one generation per year. Uh, the adults are usually seen around May or June. Then they lay eggs, the larvae, the young larvae start to bore into the needles. They continue feeding through the fall. Then over winter, the larvae uh, kind of hibernate inside those twigs. Then in the spring, they'll start to feed a little bit more and then pupate and then emerge as adults. So around May or June, if you're starting to see this and you suspect you have these moths, you can go around to your plants. If you kind of shake them or touch them, you'll see these little tiny moths flit, flitter about, uh, very tiny, like I said, only a few millimeters long. So less than a quarter or an eighth of an inch. Um, but these are not super common here. They're more common up north, but we do get samples in sometimes of this moth um, affecting junipers and uh, or, or, or affecting arborvitae uh, and things like that. So, uh, but that's that's basically the the spruce spider mites and the scale insects are the and uh, bagworms are the most common pests of uh, cypresses uh, in North Carolina. Of course, there are a few borers and things like that that get into especially stress plants, uh, but uh, you know there aren't a lot of primary borers or or, or insects that attack really healthy plants. Uh, but uh, you know, each situation is a little bit different and we can go into that later if anybody has questions. Um, so that's all I have, Mike, for that part, I think. All right, unless there are questions from Matt. Oh, he, there's one there, Matt. Can you treat for the leaf miners? Um, I, I have to look it up. I think you might be able to. Um, I think the best time to treat though is if you have again a population that you know of um, is to wait for the adults uh, to emerge. So basically that generation will kind of all emerge 
uh, the adults flying around are much easier to treat because they're more susceptible to things like contact pesticides and whatnot. Uh, once they're in the needles, I think they're a little bit more difficult to control, uh, but I'd have to look up uh, if there are some uh, chemicals that can be used. I'll, get, I'll put that in the, the chat. I'll, I'll put a link in there in the chat. All right, then I'm going to stop sharing so that Charlotte can resume her uh, or, or take it from here, I guess, and tell us what we can do if we want something other than arborvitaes and Leylands. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. And uh, both, uh, that was excellent. Uh, that was just wonderful. I feel much more equipped when I visit my mom next time and she says to me, why are those arborvitae dying? <laughs> I can go out and take a closer look and know some specific things to look for. Um, so that, that was truly excellent. Um, so we've seen many reasons not to potentially plant uh, things like Leyland cypress and arborvitae. There are a lot of serious issues out there that you can't do anything about. And especially when we're looking at screening, people like to do all of the same, you know, like we see in this picture, we've got a group of Leylands, um, and when one of them dies, it leaves a gap. And, um, you know, that can, can be kind of distressing, not only just visually, but it, you no longer get that screening effect you were going for. Um, so we're gonna talk about some other things you can plant instead of Leyland cypress and arborvitae for screening. And these are going to be, um, some plants that are, are hopefully a little more resilient and durable in our landscape and longer lived. Um, and just I want to throw out there that, that diversity is always the key to a healthy, resilient landscape. Uh, and we don't often talk about diversity in screening because uh, people want everything to look the same. But, you know, you can mix it up. And even if you don't just have 20 individually different plants in a screening planting, you could do a, a group of three or four of something and then three or four of something else. So at least it's not just one huge long planting, all the same thing that if an issue develops, it's just gonna run right down the line. Um, also, there are lots and lots of options because there is no such thing as a one plant fits all <laughs> landscape solution. Um, you always have to think about your site and you, you, you know, look in, at practical things like, you know, what's available and um, what you're going for with the plant selection in your landscape. And there, we have an excellent, excellent tool that many Master Gardener volunteers have helped to build out, and that is our Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox. I encourage everybody to explore it to find options for your landscape. So let's look at some things that came from the Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox, some options instead of Leyland's. And we're going to focus on some of our holly species um, and, and broadleaf in general. Our broadleaf evergreens um, tend to be more resilient here in our southern landscapes than the needled evergreens, or, or especially the cypress family, which we've been talking about today. Um, and with these evergreen hollies, they are especially durable and long-lived. You know, people for screening tend to want something that's very fast-growing, but often something that's very fast growing is not necessarily really long lived or as we see today, you know, it might get large fast, but then it, they start to die. So um, you would have been much better off to plant something that maybe had a moderate growth rate, but was going to be longer lived. And that's where we are with hollies. Um, they will grow in sun to part shade. They prefer well-drained soil, but they're, they're quite drought tolerant. And, um, you know, as long as it's not too wet all the time, like a, like a pond, they should be pretty happy. Um, they are very long lived. Um, you know, no plant is totally pest free, but in general, they don't have serious issues like some of the things we've been talking about on Leylands and Arborvitae. And um, there are many, many cultivars available and hybrids. So even if a lot of hollies are being used in the landscape, it is not, they're not all genetically identical. So that's one thing that gives them an additional strength and diversity as well. That's just the amount of hybrids and cultivars that are out there. And uh, many of the um, toughest are these Ilex cornuta, which is actually the Chinese holly, the cultivars and hybrids of Ilex cornuta. And they include things like Nellie Stevens, which you see in the picture, which is probably one of the most popular hollies for screening and just one of these large upright evergreens. Um, most of these varieties get, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 feet tall, um, at close to 10 feet wide. Um, things like the needlepoint holly, similar, it's a little, little rounder, more than pyramidal. 
And then Emily Bronner and Mary Nail have really broad leaves. Um, and oak leaf is what's called one of the red hollies, which is a series of hollies that have reddish new growth. So from a distance, they all look really similar. But if you get up close and study the foliage, you'll see you'll see differences. But they all work well for this type of very long-term screening plant. Um, so I, I encourage everybody to consider hollies when you are thinking about screening or need some type of upright evergreen. If you are specifically looking for a native plant, we do have some native hollies. Actually, many of our native hollies are deciduous, um, but we do have some evergreen species. And um, the ones that we tend to see in the landscape more and find available from nurseries are often this Ilex cross attenuata, which is a hybrid between two native species, Ilex cassine, the cassine holly, um, or sometimes called dahoon, and then Ilex opaca, which is the American holly. Um, so American holly on its own is a, is a beautiful, beautiful plant, but tends to be rather slow growing. So um, it does naturally cross in some of these varieties. These, these selections are naturally occurring um, hybrids that have been selected. Um, and when you get that cross, you tend to get a little hybrid vigor, so you get a more vigorous plant. So a couple of things you can look out for if you're looking for something, especially if you if you uh, want to go for a little bit more of a natural look and let it grow open and loose, not shear the plant. Um, things like savanna holly. Make sure you don't take the lower limbs off if you want that screening effect. Um, and then this other picture is a foster holly, um, which are often sheared to within an inch of their life. And they'll certainly withstand that type of treatment, but you don't have to do that. And um, th this picture is just showing the difference between kind of just an open, um, naturally grown cultivar of these Alex attenuata types versus one that's had some of the lower growth removed and been sheared. Um, but, you know, if, if that was left to grow naturally, the foster would look very similar to the savanna holly. Um, so those are a couple of options out there. Of course, like all of our hollies, there are separate male and female plants. These are both female cultivars, so you see the beautiful red berries in the winter. Um, all hollies are very attracted to bees when the blooms uh, open in the spring. They actually smell a little bit like honey, and I often wonder if that's part of what attracts the bees, but I don't know for sure. Um, so they have some good ecosystem service value in our landscapes. The other one I've thrown in here is Yopon, which is a native Ilex vomitoria, um, which occurs in the coastal plain in North Carolina, particularly at the coastal region, extremely um, salt tolerant plant. And you can see here, Yopon uh, of all of our plants in the southeast will take the most torture when it comes to pruning. And anytime you see in a southern garden something pruned into typically into uh, you know some unusual shape that takes a tremendous amount of pruning, it's it's almost always Yopon to tolerate that that amount of um, pruning. But you don't have to do that if you let it grow naturally. It is it is definitely more open and and a little um, more natural looking for sure. Um, but it can be sheared and that will certainly thicken it up. Um, especially if you're looking for something, um, you know, that gets a, a lot of salt or you need something extremely drought tolerant, just extremely tough all around is, is Yopon. Um, and there's also dwarf forms, which we often see every parking lot in the south has at least one dwarf Yopon somewhere, and uh, weeping forms, which are often planted as a more of a specimen. So switching from hollies, um, which will certainly grow in sun to part shade, but if you're looking um, for something for a little bit maybe shadier sites or something that has good deer resistance, which hollies in general, I find the deer will nibble the new growth. Um, they don't tend to like the older growth because when the leaves get you know, more fully formed and, and hardened up, they are prickly often. A lot of them are prickly, but they will they will nibble the new growth, which actually from a screening standpoint can be helpful <laughs> as a type of pruning. Um, but if you've got really high deer pressure and you're looking for something, you might want to think about something like Clara, um, which is Turnstromia gymnanthera. Um, it is one of the another one of these very, very tough broadleaf evergreen shrubs. Um, it will grow in sun or shade. Um, once it's established, it's very drought tolerant. Um, it's just a tough, tough, tough all around plant with, with nice glossy green leaves. Um, the flowers aren't very significant, but it's, it definitely does a, a good job at screening um, again and stays quite dense in the shade. Um, 
Fortune's Osmanthus is another nice one, not quite as shade tolerant as Clay, Clayura, so it's going to be happier in sun to part shade. Um, but the really nice thing about it is that um, it has small white flowers in the fall that are extremely fragrant. So you don't necessarily see the flowers so much, but you can definitely smell them. And it's just very, very wonderful fragrance that drifts through the landscape. And then if you're dealing with a lot of shade, and especially if you've got wet soils, um, consider Elysium. There are a couple of different species of Elysium out there. There's actually more than two, but um, I wanted to mention the Elysium parviflorum, the anna shrub. Very tough plant, very vigorous plant. Um, eventually, over time, it can start to sucker, so form little underground sprouts. Um, so you know, form quite a wide colony. So that's something definitely to keep in mind, especially in sites that have more moisture. Um, and then the Elysium floridanum really does require shade. Both of these are happier in more acidic soils. Um, the floridanum has these very interesting looking flowers um, in, the, in the later spring. And, you know, if you just saw either one of them on its own, you might think of something like rhododendron, which, of course, if you're in our western counties, that's also a great option for shade or rhododendron. There are many more plants you can explore on the Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox. Make sure to check out the Find a Plant feature, which lets you select many, many, many different attributes you're looking for, from plant size to what you're trying to attract to what you're trying to avoid. Um, you can make all kinds of choices, and it will narrow down your options and give you the plants that best fit um, what you are looking for. So that is our Plant These Instead, Instead feature for, uh, for February. And now I'm going to turn it back to Matt and Mike who are going to share some bolos and be on the lookout on um, pest and plant disease issues for this time of year. And I'll see if there are any questions while they're getting their share up. Um, yeah, Mike, somebody you... a comment about the Carolina Sapphire Cypress doing well, um, and again, I would just, usually with a lot of our cypresses, they start off doing really well and um, not necessarily continue to do really well long term. And I see that uh, a comment about deer eating hollies, which yes, deer can, nibble, can eat hollies, especially with high pressure. Question about hollies that are resistant to scale, not that I know of, and I don't know if, uh, Matt, you've come across that, but um, yeah. there are some different scale that could be an issue on hollies. Yeah, I, I can answer that a little bit. I put a fact sheet for the cottony, um, oh, the scale. I call it cottony scale because it's on so many hosts. They they call it all different things. It can get on anything from yews, taxis, to hollies, to maples, to I've even seen them on poison ivy. So a uh, really broad host range. I The broadleaf hollies are most attacked by those, uh, but things like uh, um, Yopan, Ilex vomitoria doesn't really get attacked by them, although they sometimes get some armored scales on the twigs. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Ilex vomitoria also gets a, a type of um, jumping plant louse that creates little galled leaves. Uh, look, um, but they, they really aren't too much of an issue. So, um, but yeah, different species. I would say the broadleaf hollies are more attacked by things like leaf miners, um, scales, uh, the cottony scales and things like that. So, uh, but we can talk about that more later. Uh, Mike, do you want me to go first for the bolos? Uh, why don't you take it, Matt? Sure, okay. Well, I will share my screen. Maybe hopefully everybody can see that. Okay, um, just some quick bolos. Uh, Mike has a few things to talk about, but we'll just go over this quickly. Uh, so for March, um, you know, it's still going to be cool out. It'll still get. It'll start to be getting warmer. Uh, so things are going to be starting to wake up. These critters are going to be waking up. Uh, the first thing to be on the lookout for are the ground nesting bees. So these are going to be typically nesting in more bare soiled areas, so, uh, areas with less vegetation, like you see here. Uh, they'll push up little mounds and they'll have a distinct hole in the middle, some, some, sometimes many hundreds of thousands of them nesting in this area. These bees are really important pollinators. They are not aggressive. Uh, in fact, to get these photos, you can see this little, this little cute little bee poking its head out here. Uh, I laid around in this whole mass of them uh, just to get these photos and they didn't bother me at all. They're, they're very timid. 
uh, and very good pollinators. So if you can stand them, they're, they're really great to have around and they really are only active for a couple weeks in the early spring, at least this group. You'll see some solitary bee, ground nesting bees come out later than year as well. Uh, but be on the lookout for them. Uh, fall canker worms are another one. So these are the little green inchworms that are going to be hatching. They're called fall canker worms because the adults are actually active in the fall and winter where they mate. The females are wingless and lay eggs on trees. And in the spring, once it starts to warm up, these little inchworms will hatch and uh, start to consume leaves. Sometimes in outbreak seasons, they can completely defoliate small trees. Uh, but you'll see these little inch, green inchworms, sometimes they're a different color, a little bit more black or brown, uh, hanging from trees. And the way, best way to ID the fall canker worms is that they have two pairs of well-developed prolegs, and then they have these little stumpy ones uh, right there in front of the first pair. Uh, so that's distinct for this species. So if you find these inchworms, that's what you've got. Some termites are gonna start swarming right, right now or around this time of year when it starts to warm up, especially the uh, um, southern uh, subterranean termite, the uh, reticulotermes flavipes. And uh, these are what winged uh, termites look like. So they're dark body, they have these lacy wings, uh, not to be confused with ants. There will be some ants as well that swarm in the spring, uh, but Termites uh, will spread, will uh, um, emerge, the reproductives will emerge to create new colonies, often out in nature in wood that's uh, underground. But if they're emerging from your home, obviously uh, that's a problem. So definitely call somebody and, and figure out what the best treatment is. Uh, of course, the social wasps, uh, the queens have been overwintering uh, either out in the environment or sometimes even in homes. And so once it starts to warm up enough, these queens will that have been mated, that were mated last fall, will wake up ready to build a, a nest. They do all the work at first and start the nest until they lay eggs that will develop into workers uh, uh, or nest mates that will start to um, work on the nest as well. So you may see some of these wasps flying around. Uh, those are the ones that are just waking up from hibernation. And in the same vein, um, larger bugs. So different bugs, especially here's a brown marmorated stink bug and these very large leaf footed bugs in the genus Acanthocephala are gonna be flying around on warm days in the spring. And so it seems like they just come out of nowhere but they've really just been hibernating uh, for the winter. And once it gets to be a nice temperature, they start to wake up and look for sites to feed uh, and mate and produce eggs. So that's all I have for the bolos for March. Again, it's gonna be a little cool still. Uh, once uh, once March into April, next, uh, next month when we do our bolos, we'll talk about a few other pests that'll be uh, more prevalent as well. Okay. So moving on to the disease bolos, and again, bolo is be on the lookout if you're new to the program. These are the items that we highlight to be watching for in the coming month, although we aren't getting into things like details on the biology and, and control, but just so you have a reference when you're talking to people over the next month. And we also have these and a longer list even on our website. So if you go to the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic website, you can find a link to BOLOs month by month. But the ones that I wanna just mention quickly for March starting, there's not much yet in the vegetable garden, but the uh, crucifers, probably the, the big one that <clears throat> you wanna be watching for will be sclerotinia stem rot. Start out as kind of a, a soft rot and eventually get this visible white mold on it and uh, will affect any of your crucifers. The, then on the onions, if anyone happens to have that, Botrytis leaf blight would be something to watch for, as well as Botrytis on pansies. So you see the picture there on the right, Botrytis blight and the, and the flowers and then even the leaves. And also as the season for the pansies kind of wanes, we may start to see some nutrient deficiencies and uh, you may have already seen some black root rot and pythium root rot affecting the plants, so not just in the tops, but actually causing either general yellowing or the meltdown of, of the plant. Uh, Phytophthora crown rot can do that as well. The riope, the tips with the anthracnose, the fungal infection there, or if the whole thing goes down, it could be fusarium crown rot or even Phytophthora crown rot. 
<clears throat> on turf grasses, fairy rain, we mentioned that every month because that can occur any turf any month. Also large patch on your warm season grasses and spring dead spot. Now, right now, of course, your Bermuda and your Zoysia are gonna be all dormant, but as they start to come out of dormancy, areas that were infected last fall with the fungi that cause spring dead spot will not green up and you'll start to see, uh, as the name implies, dead spots in the spring and shown in the photograph there. And finally, you may be seeing some leaf spot uh, caused by the fungi Drexlera on your either bluegrass or Bermuda. On trees and shrubs, Phytophthora and Armillaria root rots aren't just about the Arborvitaes and the Leylands. There, there are a number of hosts there. So be aware that they can be, uh, symptoms can be visible any time of year. Camellia petal blight on the Japonicas will be a problem as these start coming out. I'll show another couple of photos there in a moment. And that can be confused for frost injury. We've talked about it before on the program. Boxwood blight, also something to, to be on the lookout for. While the trees are bare, Septibacidium felt fungus growing on scale insect colonies is something that you may notice in the yard or in the woods. And Entomosporium leaf spot on the evergreen, the uh, Indian hawthorns shown on the left there is gonna be something that you see pretty much any time of year. Again, trees being bare, we're gonna notice our black nut on the cherries and the plums. We could start seeing fire blight on pear, which is particularly susceptible. Quince rust, on eastern red cedar, not on the quince yet, not on the on the uh, calorie pears yet, but I'll show a picture of what you might see coming up in March in a moment. And then of course, cold injury and frost damage, as well as sap sucker injury. I saw some pretty dramatic uh, example of that. Was it earlier this month or, or last month where the tree was basically black from all the sap that had oozed on it? And branch pruning by squirrels is something that may that may happen. So we've talked about before in the program how you can distinguish frost injury to the camellia blossoms from camellia petal blight by pulling the base of the flower off and looking for the ring of fungal tissue. It's not a perfect test though, so you may not see it. If you had a microscope, you could see it just starting on these, but the moral of the story is to look at a couple of different blossoms to decide before you decide whether you've got camellia petal blight or frost injury. Here's an example, actually I think this was a nursery, but cedar quince rust on eastern red cedar is a more subtle, one of the more humble of our gymnosporangium rusts, and it's going to form swellings like this with the gelatinous yellow, I'm sorry, orange kind of uh, material where the spores are produced that are gonna blow over and if lucky, reach some quince or a cow repair or one of the other rosaceous hosts that then infect. This comes out earlier than our cedar apple rust, which this is a photograph now from December, but they're still going to be inactive until we get those first warm rains in April. And then you get the big gelatinous telial horns. So that'll probably be a bowl of next time. Just a quick set of reminders for late winter and early spring in the garden when it comes to disease prevention. Uh, clean up the residue from last year's perennials if you haven't done that already and give your liriope a haircut to reduce the amount of fungal carryover into this year. If you do have beds that do stay too wet uh, and that you're not making into a rain garden, then raise those, incorporate organic matter to try and improve the drainage and have fewer problems with Phytophthora and Pythium. Make sure that your mulch layer is about two to three inches under camellias and roses to reduce the petal blight and reduce the initial inoculum, we call it, of the black spot pathogen on roses, which can also overwinter on canes. So make sure that those are pruned as they, as they break dormancy. And plan your rotation for your, your vegetable garden if you haven't done that already. <clears throat> and finally, just a kind of a, a selfless, I mean, sorry, what's it called? Uh, shameless self-promotion here, go back and look at the April 2020 plants, pests, and pathogens. We we'll went into detail about how to take good photographs because as problems start to come in this year and people are, are wanting to get pictures of them and get things diagnosed, uh, it's helpful to have really good pictures and we went into detail on that at that time. Lastly, I wanna mention something that um, 
I got some pictures from Dr. Frank Lowe's, who's now the head of the horticulture science department. But he had been involved here in, in plant pathology on the whole idea of grafting tomatoes for management of soil-borne disease. And the most popular method is this tube graft where you take the rootstock and graft the cyan on it and hold it with a little plastic tube, put it into a high humidity situation until the graft union forms and graft these things as seedlings. And it turns out that this is a really effective way of dealing with some of our most recalcitrant soil-borne disease problems. And here is a graphic that Frank had provided to me. And you'll notice that a couple of different races of Fusarium and Verticillium, Verticillium being more a problem in the mountains on, on tomatoes, but uh, with varying degrees of success, you can, you can use grafts for this. But the really big news is how grafting works against our bacterial wilt, southern bacterial wilt of tomatoes, and, uh, and it also affects especially solanaceous crops, but a few other things as well. And um, that is a disease for which we really didn't have any good options except giving up on tomatoes or growing them in containers. But now there is something that can be done and, and is quite effective. And also, uh, even against nematodes, it can be useful. So here is a, a picture of southern bacterial wilt and grafted versus non-grafted tomatoes on infested soil. So if you have folks who have had problems growing tomatoes because of some of these soil-borne issues, in particular, I would say with the bacterial wilt, then this is something that, that might be an option. Now, the obvious question is, where do I get a hold of these? And I'm going to just say that I know of one place that Frank mentioned, but I don't want to give promotion of one versus others that might also be out there. So um, we might need to do a little research on that. But the, the important thing is that this is an area that master gardeners may be able to kind of get together and put together uh, orders, pre-orders that would be an incentive for any producer to come up with these things if they if they choose to do so, or even to get involved in growing some of the rootstocks, which are are open pollinated and free, uh, and uh, and doing grafting as a project. So I'm going to let Charlotte take the ball from there, actually, and uh, and talk about that with you folks at at the time of her choosing. But I just wanted to put it out there that we do have now the possibility of addressing some of our our difficult disease problems in tomatoes. All right. With that, Charlotte, it is all yours. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. And um, that was an excellent handoff because I have this um, first thing up to discuss, this uh, discussion that will be coming up. We've got some great opportunities coming up between now and our next plants and pests and pathogens to connect and learn. And March 11th at 1 o'clock, we'll be hosting a discussion for agents and master gardener volunteers on plant sale alternatives, um, which will include things about holding plant sales this spring or, or in the future, just ways, um, you know, particularly during COVID to reduce contact, to um, put best practices in place to keep people as safe as possible, um, but also some alternatives. And one of those potential alternatives would be doing something like a targeted sale where you identify something like these grafted tomatoes that um, you could get and make available for the public, which are currently, you know, much more difficult for them to locate. Um, and 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 we'll see, uh, follow up on a couple of leads about potential sources for those, but I do invite um, if anybody knows of a source, if you've had a source, a wholesale source, and you've done that type of plant sale, and I see in the chat that Chatham County Master Gardener volunteers are doing a grafted tomato sale right now for the second year. Um, so that's excellent. And um, if you know of a source for those types of, of uh, plants, I encourage you to put it into the chat, and those are things we can follow up on and have available to talk about on March 11th. Um, so, and I will definitely want to mention with that discussion is sponsored by the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association. Um, and it is the first of a series of discussions we'll be holding throughout the year that will give volunteers and agents across the state a chance to connect and um, learn about 
um, some resources that are available around specific topics and efforts and, and share their experiences. We will have um, Mass Gardener volunteers from a couple of different counties talking about their plant sale efforts in 2020 and lessons they learned and can recommend for 2021 during that discussion. So I hope to see you all then. Then on March 16th, we have uh, coming up the turf and lawn update. This will be with Dr. Grady Miller and Matt Martin with the Soil Science Department. They both work with turf, turf files. And um, this is one of our continuing educa education webinars. The details are posted on the Extension Master Gardener intranet calendar. Um, and you can sign up from there. That will, uh, when you sign up from the intranet calendar, that'll create uh, education hours entry for you that makes it really easy to submit um, to make sure you get credit for all of your ongoing education hours. Um, with our continuing education webinars, they're made possible through donations that go to the Extension Master Gardener Endowment. So appreciate everyone who helps support both our state association and our Master Gardener Endowment to make these opportunities available. There are some other great learning opportunities coming up with the self-paced courses and plant ID. This is the instructor uh, who leads those efforts is Laura Barth, and this is a partnership with Longwood Gardens and NC State Horticultural Science Department. And uh, the three different courses will be offered starting March 22nd. So this is a perfect time to register um, a new course um, is going to focus just on vegetables, herbs, fruits, and nuts, so those edible plants. This will be a great one to sign up for. Um, and then the, the recurring annuals, perennials, vines, and ground covers will be offered, as well as trees, shrubs, and conifers. And if you have things on your schedule, you won't be able to participate in these six-week courses in March. They will also be offered in July and again in October, so lots of opportunities to be part of that. There is a discount for extension professionals and master gardener volunteers. Um, check with your agent for those discount codes, or if you uh, can't find it otherwise, please contact Laura to get that information. I'm going to drop um, these links that I have in the chat. So several of these slides do have links and um, then you have access to them. Also coming up, in fact, starting next week is an online course, the Introduction to Therapeutic Horticulture. This one's a, a little bit more expensive um, than the Plant ID courses. I think they tend to be around $60 for Master Gardener volunteers and extension professionals. I'd have to check that to make sure. But the Therapeutic Hort course, um, it does also have a discount for Master Gardener volunteers and extension professionals, and you can learn more about and register for that from the link that was dropped in the chat, but I would recommend to do that very soon uh, because it starts next week. And then just a few final things to make sure you have on your calendar the International Master Gardener Conference. This is held every other year, typically in person, but of course this year is exceptional and a decision about whether to do it in person or virtual had to be made back in December. And um, so the decision was made to go virtual and the registration for that will open April 5th. This is going to be hosted by the Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Program in Virginia, in Virginia Tech, and they held their own conference virtually last year and did an excellent job. So I know that they will do a wonderful job. They have a lot of really exciting things um, planned. And one neat thing about being virtual is that it will open up the opportunity for many, many people to attend who maybe would not have been able to attend if they had to travel to Virginia. The registration is going to be $150. That is much less expensive than if it was an in-person conference. They have some really great speakers lined up, so I encourage you to go to the website and check out what's being planned. And also want to make sure you know that the, the our North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association will be offering partial scholarships um, for association members. They'll have details about that coming up really soon. Um, if you're not a member of the association, you can join online from their website, which is ncemgva.org. And the last thing that goes along with the International Master Gardener Conference is also the International Master Gardener Search for Excellence. So this is also held every other year. It is a national search for excellence among Master Gardener programs all across the country. And we have a strong reputation to uphold because in 2019, 
North Carolina had two winners. Um, we had both uh, uh, first place winners, actually, first place recipients. Guilford County, our Master Gardener volunteers in Guilford County um, were first place uh, winners for the demonstration garden category for their crevice garden, and our Master Gardener volunteers in Dare County um, also were first place recipients for the workshop and presentation category for their Speakers Bureau. So we want to see lots of representation for North Carolina um, in our international search for excellence. You can go online to learn more um, about the application process. It is an online application and those applications are due May 1st and they should be for projects that took place between 2018 and 2020 and you can see the categories listed. Um, and just be aware that if you are a first, second, or third place recipient, you will be expected to provide a short video, a three minute video about your project, um, which can, can be something as simple as a narrated PowerPoint. So don't let that be something that stops you from applying. And we look forward to seeing everybody back next month, March 23rd, where uh, we will be um, joined by Inga Meadows, which, uh, again, she is with NC State, and um, she'll be talking about some of her research that has um, given us some options for these Phytophthora-infested landscapes, particularly when it comes to annuals and herbaceous perennial ornamental plants. In between now and then, you can catch up and review um, on our playlist. You can go to the recording index, um, and you can see the current schedule, and those were among the links that were I dropped in the chat. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, and I hope everyone is able to get out and enjoy the beautiful, beautiful spring weather. Um, and that between now and March, that you stay safe and healthy. So thank you all. I see that, um, excuse me for, um, and you tied it up so nicely, oh, yeah, but yeah. I, I want to go back to a question in the chat. Well, there was one about Camellia Petal Blight, and I put in a link there, but there was a gene who asked, should we rotate squash plants? But then the rest of the message, I, it didn't come through quite quite uh, clearly as to what the, what the question was. So if you could maybe retype that gene in the box and um, so I can understand the question about squash and rotation. And while that's getting typed up, I, that reminded me, thank you, Mike, um, of a question I didn't get to when we were talking about alternatives for Leyland Cypress. We were talking about a lot of things that get quite large and um, there was a question in the chat about it, anything that gets six to eight foot. Um, and that is actually six to eight foot is a really difficult uh, category of plant to find for as far as evergreen shrubs. There are things that will grow six to eight feet, um, but they'll keep on growing and they'll get bigger. So um, most things that only ever reach that type of height are very slow growing. So especially when you're thinking about screening, um, people tend to want stuff a little faster growing. Um, so I would encourage you, again, you could go to the plant toolbox and explore what's there. But in general, plants that only ever reach six to, to eight foot in height of, among our evergreens tend to be some of our much more slow growing varieties. Okay, I think the, the question's there now. Uh, with squash bugs, will they get under if squash bugs, or is that the one? Let's see. Will rotating disrupt pollination? Is that the question you were referring to, Mike? That, that's the question I was asking about. Um, okay. it sounds like it's more for Matt, though, and okay. rotating disrupting pollination. I mean, they do have the male and female flowers on on the same plant, but as different flowers. I don't think that would really be would be an issue, um, but I'll let Matt address the squash bug. I assume that that was referring to overwintering, um, but again, I'm not understanding completely, but Matt, oh, maybe um, have a better take on that. Yeah, I, if that does mean overwintering, um, if squash bugs over winter get under or near the squash plant will rotate and disrupt pollination. Um, I, I'm not sure about that question. Um, so the, the larger squat, the, 
ugh, squash bugs. I have to see. I have to look it up about squash bugs in particular. Because squash bugs are a different type of leaf-footed bug, not the ones I, I discussed uh, today as far as looking out for. Um, so um, let me get back to you about that one. Um, I don't. We don't necessarily normally see them very early in the season. Um, let me see something. Hmm. I actually don't know very much about how they overwinter. Um, again, I, we typically see them more in the middle of the season of the year, around the summer. Um, don't really see them active kind of early in the year, as, as early in the year. Uh, but let me see. There's, uh, let me see if I can find some information on that. So don't want to hold everybody up. I'm not sure if everybody's waiting for me, but... <laughs> Well, and I guess part of the the, uh, the conundrum would be how mobile are they? Because you, when we talk about rotation for diseases, we're thinking about things that are are in the soil. And so, if by by planting squash, you know, ten or twenty feet away from where you had it last year, is that really going to be enough distance to? Oh to no, yeah, they 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 can move. Um, you know, so if they're overwintering. Um, if the adults overwinter, then they obviously are winged and they can move. They can fly a distance. Uh, and actually, often in the, the larger leaf footed bugs that are related to squash bugs, people hear them flying around in the spring. They're very large. They sound like a big wasp flying around. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, again, I, I have to find some information. If, if you want to send me an email, if you have a specific question, uh, I can try and find the information for you. But as far as I know, uh, you don't really see squash bugs very early in the spring. Uh, I think they may overwinter as a different a, uh, stage. Uh, typically, you really see them, the eggs in the summer uh, and the, the adults and the, the nymphs and the adults kind of shortly after that, of course. Um, But okay, well, if yeah, please email me and I'll try and get you that information. All right, thank you, Matt. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.